right. Uh, before we finish, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the Evansville Wartime Museum. I have our mission statement up there. Uh, you've heard a lot probably over the years now about what happened here in Evansville during World War II. This town um, did a lot. And there were probably over 80 different factories here producing items for the military effort. Over 330 different products made either in Evansville or in the tri-state area. So we have a lot uh, to be thankful for, uh, a lot that the people here in the city did, and we don't want to forget that. That's what's happened, uh, I think, in the past 70, 75 years, is this story, in some cases, has kind of drifted away. And so we're trying to make sure that the people of Evansville remember and never forget what happened here in the city. And that's what you see up there in our mission statement, is to uh, collect, preserve, and make accessible those objects that were produced here in the city during the war, and to get personal accounts of those local home front workers and the veteran heroes, so that future generations will learn about what happened here in the city. Now, if you take a look at our logo, it's up here on the screen, and it's right here. The uh, bar and the circle is from the E Award pin that was given to those factories that earned the quote E award and that was based on quality and quantity of production, uh, work stoppages, uh, training, and there was a, a, a long list of criteria and it was an annual award. Only about 4% of companies in the entire nation earned that award and we had 38 of them here in the city, 15 companies, so many of the companies earned the award more than once. Cervell and Hoosier Cardinal won the award five years in a row. Now each employee would be given a pin, and the pin is what you're seeing here on this logo, and I've got one on my collar right here. So each of the employees would get a certificate and then one of these pins. And then the company would get a flag, and the flag would have, uh, if you earned more than once, it would have the stars on it to indicate how many years you won. So that's what you see in our logo. In the middle, you see LST-157, the first LST that came off uh, and out of the shipyard. You see a Thunderbolt airplane. Uh, it's probably not the first one. The first one was the Hoosier Spirit. You see a tank because Chrysler uh, rebuilt thousands of Sherman tanks here in the city. And you see ammunition. Chrysler made billions of bullets here in the city for, for the war effort. And then you see the stars and the big E at the top. The big E can stand for the, the E Award. It can stand for Evansville. It can stand for a lot. So that's what we're trying to represent at the Evansville Wartime Museum. We are actually open now. We opened Memorial Day weekend. We're on Saturdays from 10 to 4, Sundays from 12 to 4. The admission is $5 for adults. Seniors over 65, veterans, children between 6 and 17 are $4, and under 6 is free. We're located at Highway 41, right here, and uh, Petersburg Road. There's a Dairy Queen right there, so you might remember that Dairy Queen. So we're this last hanger on the right. This is what it looks like inside the museum. Um, it was originally a hanger for Bristol Myers Squibb. <clears throat> then a very plastic, now it's our museum. But as you come in the front door, uh, we have a reception area. Over here is the home front gallery where the exhibits are designed around some of those factories that we've been talking about. Uh, Chrysler, <coughs> Shipyard, Republic, Hoosier Cardinal, Cervell. Then you walk from the honor gal or from the home front gallery into the uh, big uh, main hall where we have a lot of our military vehicles. Then you can come back down here into the Honor Gallery where we have um, artifacts and personal items from some soldiers who were from Evansville and uh, in World War II. And then number seven here is our Community Gallery, which is dedicated to the USO and the Red Cross canteens. And then uh, I mentioned earlier, a lot of books written on the subject, so if you want to read up, uh, and get more of the background, see a lot of the uh, photos that have been collected. Uh, most of these books are available at Barnes and Noble, and some of them you can find on Amazon.com. Thank you for coming.
This is Mary Russ, and she's going to sing the national anthem. Thank you.
we have some uh, folks from the shrine who would like to speak with you for just a couple of minutes. Thank you, Don. Uh, I'm Donnie Moser, co-chair of the festival this year. This is Scott Thompson, chairman of all the vendors that come in. We also have our uh, illustrious Steve Harris with us and a couple other dignitaries. We appreciate everybody coming out. I want to say thank you to all the veterans uh, for your service. We really do. Uh, welcome to our festival. Enjoy the show. And once again, thank you. My name is Donna Bone. We have several other folks here from the Wartime Museum. I'd like for them all to stand up right now so I can introduce them. So we have uh, Jeff Dye here. <laughs> Behind the camera helping us uh, videotape is Dr. Mark Browning. We have Steve Witte over here on the side. Back in the kitchen, I'm not sure where he is now, that was Dick McCune. And we have uh, with us Alan Sanderson, who's going to help me with the presentation. So, so before I like to talk about some of the uh, what went on during World War II, I think it's important to set the stage first to get a feel for what it was like here in Evansville before the war. So now we're back for 75 years, it's 1940, 1941. Franklin Roosevelt had just been elected to his third term. There were about 97,000 people here in the city of Evansville. Unemployment was between 10 and 15%. Remember, they're just coming off the depression. And uh, employment was, was a little shaky. Around 18,000 factory jobs here in the city. And the word was that they were expecting layoffs around 2,000 jobs to be lost in 1942. So Evansville was, was in a shaky position back in 1940 and 1941. What the people in this city didn't know was that in the background, the political leaders, the labor leaders, and the heads of the industries were all working together. Imagine that. <laughs> they were all working together because they knew Evansville would be a good spot for a defense factory. Of course, Pearl Harbor is what kind of jump-started everything. And after Pearl Harbor, things changed overnight here in the city of Evansville. Franklin Roosevelt knew that we were going to need two things to win this war. The first thing, soldiers. What's the second thing you need to win a war? Supplies. They have to have tanks, trucks, <laughs> planes, guns, ammo, food, clothing, and that's where Evansville kicked in big time. These are the soldiers that went to the war from the city of Evansville. So you see there were over 13,000 inducted that went to fought, fight in World War II. About five, a little over 5% were wounded, around 3% were killed in action, and about 130 were prisoners of war. This is what was reported in the Courier Press at the time. But where Evansville really kicked in was in providing the supplies. And I said, 
We had folks in the background working in 1940 and 1941, and they were in Washington, D.C., and where some of the bigger factories were. And they told them, they said, Evansville is an ideal spot for a factory, a defense factory. Why do you think that is? What would make Evansville a good spot for a defense factory? The river. The river? Of course, we're sitting right on the river here. That was a big one. What else? Railroads. A lot of railroads in the city back then. Airport. We had an airport. And there was another big reason why Evansville was a good spot. Where, where we were located, in the middle of the country. Remember, we had just declared war on Germany and Japan, so there was concern about invasions on the East Coast and the West Coast. So having defense factories in the middle of the country was less likely to have uh, Hitler come this far just to invade us, even though we were on his hit list. So this is where uh, the labor, the political, and the management uh, got together. And almost overnight, everything changed here in the city. We would get over 600 million in defense contracts. We would produce over 330 different products for the war effort. I said the population before the war was around 97,000. At its peak, it jumped to around 150,000 during World War II. 150,000. And those jobs, I said there were about 18,000 factory jobs. We had almost 80,000 during the war. 80 different companies in Evansville or the tri-state area making something for the war effort. One of those brand new companies to come to this city was Republic Aviation. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. But Republic didn't make those planes by themselves. There were a lot of other factories here in this city that were helping them by building parts and then supplying them to Republic. And I've just got some of them listed up there. Boots, Greg Zucher Cardinal, George Cook National Furniture, Cervell Simpson, and uh, Sunbeam. Now, some of you might recognize, like all of you are going to recognize the flag on the top. That's what was being flying here in World War II. Now, what's different about that flag and the one we fly today? All right, there were only 48 states during World War II. Now, the flag on the bottom is important too. That was the Army Navy E Award flag. And that was given to those companies that excelled in what they produced for the military. And there was a long list of criteria to earn this award. Call what you produced, the quantity, how you trained your people, work stoppages, quality control, a long list of criteria. Only about 4% of companies in the nation, defense companies, earned this award. 15 companies here in the city earned it and some of them more than once for a total of 38 E awards. Republic Aviation earned three of those awards. That's what that star up there means. So, Republic Aviation. In March of 1942, an article appeared in the paper, the Sunday paper, not the Sunday paper, the uh, Evansville paper, announcing that Republic Aviation was coming to Evansville, Indiana. That was the article over there on the left. And they were going to build on a cornfield just south of the airport. There was really nothing there but a cornfield and some shanties, some old houses that were taken down. They broke ground in April, and two months later, the office building for the plant was done. Now, how often do you see that today? Two months later. So by June, the office building was done. And this is what it looked like about that time. Now, the office building, that's Highway 41 across the top here. There's the office building. What do you notice about the office building? Exactly. It's shaped like an airplane. So they built their office building in the shape of an airplane. Now, as soon as they finished the office building, they started work on the factory. One million square feet of factory space to build these airplanes. And that's what you see down here. So they started on the left, and that's how they would start the assembly lines, on the south end of the building. And then they would go through up to the north, and by the time they got to the north end of the building, the planes would be done, and then they would fly out from there. 
This is what the plant looked like when it was finished. Back here, you see, does anybody know what that is? It's on the uh, north end of the building. It was the uh, gun butt. And that's where they practiced or they test fired uh, the machine guns on the planes. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But this was the layout, the floor plan of the plant. Uh, you can see that's the plant right there. These are the four assembly lines. There's the cafeteria for the employees, the warehouse, maintenance stores. Over here you see the uh, test modification correction hangers and the final inspection hangers. This was the modification center. Now, this was on the north side of the airport, northeast side of the airport. That's Highway 57. Somewhere here in the background. They had 900 military and civilian employees working at the modification center. Now, in the early part of World War II, they were reporting directly into the military. And their job was to modify airplanes. Uh, Harold Morgan called it a, a big garage, a big airport garage. They would take planes that had been built and would be sent to some of the uh, countries that were fighting with us in the war and modify the planes for their pilots in terms of languages, radios, colors, uh, labels, and things like that. They also did some work on experimental planes in the Modification Center. Towards the end of the war, the Modification Center uh, worked directly with Republic. During the war, the airport was leased to the military, and they reduced all flights with the exception of one commercial flight a day and um, emergencies. If there was an emergency, there would be a flight. Everything else was military. Military flights coming in and out of the airport. You can still see this little uh, building at the south end of the airport, but this was the pilot's lounge. They used the pilots to fly, and we'll talk more about this later, they had to fly the planes out of the city of Evansville to the coasts where they would be shipped overseas for the soldiers to use. Now here's that gun butt I was talking about. So it was on the, just, just on the outside of the building, uh, and this is where they would test the machine guns. The uh, P-47 Thunderbolt planes had four machine guns on each wing, 50 caliber bullets coming out. I have one around here somewhere, I'll have to dig it up. And then that's a, uh, a front view of what that looked like. But Harold and Alan were telling me that they had to test every plane. Who knows how many planes were actually built here in Evansville? How many P-47 Thunderbolt planes? 6,700 of them were built here in the city. That's almost half of what was built. Uh, the home office for Republic was actually in Farmingdale, New York. But they needed another one to keep up with the demand for the Thunderbolts, and that's when Evansville got the contract to build here. Uh, this is that picture again, and I just put it up here again so you can see that's where the gun butt was. Now, inside the factory, like I said, there were four assembly lines, and you can see riveters working on the, uh, the outside of the planes. The riveters usually worked in pairs. There was a riveter that would hold the gun in place, and you see these ladies here were holding guns, but there was usually a second riveter on the back side, and that was called a bucker, who would help buck the rivet. Uh, I, we have a couple of riveters here today. Stand, yes, uh, Lucy, Lucy Johnson here, or Lucy Wanziedler, I'm sorry, was a riveter, and Anna, where's Anna? Anna's back there by the window. Anna was a riveter. Stand, Anna, so they can see you. Okay, we have another lady here who's a riveter. What's your name? Emma Weber. Emma Weber. We have another riveter here. Now, uh, it's important to understand that the workers that were here in the city, they had one goal in their jobs. And that goal was to help win this war, and they were willing to do whatever it took to win this war. That meant working long shifts. Anna told me that she had a 12-hour um, shift that started, I believe it was 7 p.m. and then went to 7 a.m., seven days a week. 
Most of these folks worked every day, no holidays, no vacation. That's dedication. Aunt, uh, Anna told me that they would work until they got so tired they couldn't do their job anymore, and the plant would give them a day off to rest up, and then they'd start all over again. So they worked hard. Here's another look at the assembly lines, and you can see they're heading north towards the north end of the building. Back here, uh, you know, they have these wooden stands to help them get access to the parts where, where they're working on. The very next station, you can see they're putting the wings on. This one doesn't have wings. That one does. I think I have another photo here. Yes, here's another one where you can see they uh, are putting the wings on in the third station here. Down in the center is where they were uh, had the engines. They were Pratt and Whitney engines. Two rows of cylinders for a total of 18 cylinders, and we'll talk a little bit more about the engines in a minute. The first plane that came off the line was called the Hoosier Spirit, and it was in September of 1942 that first plane came off. The man hours to put one of these planes together at the time was over 22,000. In 1942, that was around 113,000, 114,000 uh, costs to build this plane. In today's dollars, that's over a million, almost $2 million. In April of 1943, Franklin Roosevelt toured some of the uh, plants in the Midwest. The uh, shipyard was an example of what they called a cornfield, a cornfield factory, because a lot of the factories that were in the middle of the country, they called them cornfield factories. But he toured a lot of these factories. Now, when he came to Evansville, he went to Republic. Now, he came into town on a train, and then they got into a car, and they went through the factory. So here's just some photos of them going through the factory. The gentleman in the back here was the governor of Indiana, Schrader, I believe his name was. And uh, at this point in the car, they're watching them demonstrate firing the machine guns at the gun butt just outside the building. Anybody know why he was in a car? Right, he couldn't walk. Not a lot of people in the country knew that our president was handicapped. They were very careful to protect his image at the time. So when he was doing things like that, he was usually from a train or in a car. And when he was giving a speech, he had heavy braces on his leg, and he usually had somebody from his family help him up to the podium. This picture right here is kind of interesting. Uh, actually, no, where is it? Oh, this one up here. Up until a couple of months ago, we thought this woman was presenting the president with a model of a P-47 Thunderbolt plane. That is a model of a P-47 Thunderbolt plane, but he's giving it to her. We found out recently that the management of Republic had given the president 10 of these to present to outstanding employees at the plant. So this is one, one of those employees getting the plane from the president. By the way, he signed um, the, uh, the register CNC for commander in chief. They, they set a lot of records, both at the shipyard and at Republic, in terms of output production. And when they made it to the 1,000th Thunderbolt, they got this note from the President of Republic, Fred Marchev. And the 1,000th plane was celebrated on December 7th, ironically, one year after Pearl Harbor, 1943. At this point, they were putting out about three planes per day. Remember that first plane? months. But as they got better and better, they were putting out more of these planes per day. So by the end of December, they were putting out three planes per day. That is the plane right there, and they called it the Tojo Special. Tojo being the uh, admiral for the Imperial Japanese Army. So this plane was for him. Uh, like I said, they set a lot of records in terms of production, and this is another article that appeared about a nationwide production record for producing the P-47 Thunderbolts. In February of 1944, they were producing these planes so fast that there was a backlog of them uh, parked around the airport in the grassy area. Almost 275 of them. Can you imagine what that must have, been look, that must have looked like? driving down Highway 41, assuming you had a car. Uh, you couldn't buy a car during World War II. 
anything that produced a military vehicle, or anything that produced vehicles was being produced for the military. You could not buy a car, a civilian, during World War II. But if you had one, this must have been a sight, seeing them parked on the runway like this. They flew out 84 of them in one day to help get this backlog down. So they were flying out of um, uh, what was then at the time the Evansville Airport. So here's a little look at some of the milestones during the war. The 2000th plane came out in May of 1944. By then they were putting out seven planes per day. In August of 44, they were doing eight per day, and that was their 3,000th plane. In December of 44, 4,000, 10 per day is what they were producing by that point. And then in March of 1945, they produced the 5,000th plane here in Evansville. And that's the plane right there. It was called the Five Grand Indiana. Get it? Five Grand, 5,000, Indiana. Five Grand Indiana. And then the 6,000th plane uh, came out in July of 1945. The last plane was produced in September of 1945. There were a lot of uh, war bond drives going on in the city and in the schools. Believe it or not, the school children raised a lot of money for war bonds. And this is one of the local high schools. Central High School made enough money to purchase one of those Thunderbolt airplanes at the time for $70,000. This is an example of an E award, and remember I was talking about the E award <coughs> earlier in the program. Each employee would get one of those pins. I'm actually wearing one on my collar. So that was an example of the E award pin, and all the employees got one and a certificate. The factory would get a flag. And there's an example of Republic getting one of their flags. So that was the Army Navy E award flag, and you see two stars on the flag, which meant they had two awards. This is a closer look flag. Right now I'm going to bring up former Major Alan Sanderson, who's also with us here at the museum. Alan actually flew one of these planes, a Thunderbolt P-47 in World War II, 118 missions. So he's going to help me talk a lot about the armament on the plane and what it was like to fly the plane. Several times before the plane would leave the factory. 
by the uh, manufacturing itself, and by the military. They must have done a good job because I've seen demonstrations on jets that they put them under stress, and I've seen the rivets pop. I never did see the rivets pop on a 47. Tell you a little bit about the 47, though. It had, as Donna mentioned, it had eight 50 caliber machine guns, four on each wing. Each gun was capable of having a, a little over 400 rounds per gun. So that's over 4,000 bullets that it would carry, that you had that much to shoot with. It was just like shooting a rifle. You aim the plane instead of, instead of a, anything else to aim. You aim the whole plane, and that's where you did, got your shot, your target spot and so forth. That's because there was no radar and there was no GPS. <laughs> Tell them how you found your target. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we had to... Uh, we didn't really have any modern way of getting navigations. We took off after our briefing, and we had a map, looked just like a road map. We laid that in our lap, and we could actually, as long as the weather was good, we could see where we were going by the, the weather and the terrain as it came up and so forth. Of course, if the weather was bad, we had to go down pretty low in order to keep up with it. But it was a whole lot different from pushing a button and saying, well, I want to go to F target and it takes you there. Um, that roadmap in your, in your lap, uh, sometimes I think it's not too bad because with all the modern things that we have in our automobiles, you don't even have to have a roadmap. There are times, believe me, that I wish I had one. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like everybody else has too. Get back to the armament on the B-47. In addition to the 850 calibers, at one time we had rockets. We put three rockets on each wing, and then we had a thousand pound bomb under the belly of it. So we really had lots of firepower, lots of damaging ways to take over the enemy. The 47 had quite a record in, uh, in the whole war. Of all the, air, uh, all the 47s that were built, uh, and all the ones that were in missions, well over, way up into thousands, they destroyed, completely destroyed, over 5,000 enemy aircraft during World War II. Not too bad for a product from Evansville. Sorry, Mayor. <laughs> No, it was, it was unforgivable. Uh, it, it just, you couldn't do anything that wasn't for your own good. I've seen them come back, as I said, where they would get too low in making a pass at a target and mush through the trees and then come back and it looked like they went through a lumber yard because all the cellars were packed with wood, but it still brought them back. Very dependent. There were two models of the 47. The first one to come out, which is the one I flew most of the time, was what they called a Razorback. If you notice, it has a straight line going from the back of the cockpit all the way back to the rudder. Well, that may have been pretty good at first, but if you think about it, you've got the up to here and the middle up to here on both sides. You couldn't see anything behind you, even, no matter how far you turned your neck. They were generous enough to put a little mirror up here, about like you have in your car. If, if you looked in the mirror, you might see somebody coming behind you, you might not. Anyway, they, they did a good job of changing that around, and they came up with a bubble canopy. They really took all that space behind that you couldn't see and turned. So when you turned your head now, of course you can see behind you, and you didn't rely on that two by two mirror. Those canopies, many of them were made here in the city of Evansville. Oh. We have one too, don't we? Yes. Yeah, we have, a, we have one of the canopies at the museum too. Also at the museum, and I, I would invite you to really come out and look at this. We have the motor, the Pratt Whitney motor. We have one out there, same motor they used in, in the P 47. Believe me, it's big. On the floor, it stands about this tall. That's just the diameter. 
So you can imagine how much power that puts out. Also, the propellers on those things would give you an idea of what comes out. The propellers are 12 feet in diameter. Now think about that, 12 feet. From the hub of the propeller out on each side, there's six feet. You got four blades. That gives you an awful lot of pull power. At one time, they even changed the propellers to what we call a paddle propeller. And with that on there, you could practically stand that airplane on its tail and go straight up because those paddle propellers just pull that air right out. Any questions? It was all desert. Uh, living conditions weren't any different. We lived in tents. Uh, a lot of Germans at that time, because they had a pretty good air force at that time. As we moved up into Italy, the German air force was pretty well on the run. Uh, we didn't see much of them in the air at all. We stretched an awful lot of them on the ground, destroyed a lot on the ground. Uh, as, as they moved north, we moved north with them. And of course, the 47 was originally meant to be an escort plane at high altitude for the bombers. It was a, a gas gozer, and it wouldn't take the bombers from, like, from England to Berlin. So they disbanded that and put 51s in, which had a little bit more uh, chance to go because with the wing tanks, and they weren't as heavy a plane, of course, they could go a lot further. We used them in Italy for ground support work. We, we followed the ground lines, the infantry, and they would give us targets, and we knew from our roadmap that we were using about where they were. We got their targets, of course, by radio, and then uh, uh, we followed up on that, and then we'd either dive bomb or go down and shoot at a low altitude and destroy whatever target they wanted us. <laughs> oh, this is her favorite story. <laughs> we were on a story, uh, a sortie up in uh, Northern Italy, and we were getting peppered pretty hard with uh, 20 millimeter anti aircraft fire, and it was bursting all around us and everything. And, I could, I could see there's a big white building down here on the left, and we were at about 5,000 feet, I guess. And there was a bomb, a gun shooting, you could just see it was right at the base of this building shooting at us. So I got on the radio and I said, you guys hold tight, I'm gonna go down and take that gun emplacement out and see if we can get a little re relief here. Well. One of my wingmen, or somebody in one of the elements, called in and said, Sandy, I don't think I'd do that. I think that's a leaning tower piece. <laughs> anyway, I, I could have been famous or infamous, who knows? Anyway, uh, Proved point that it should have been taken out. Three or four days later, we were up in the same area, same type of targets, and uh, boom, all of a sudden, I got a hold of my left wing. So, so. Well, that didn't scare you much, except uh, it hit right in the ammo box. And when you see those 50 calibers, some of them laying up on the wing, and they're pointing toward the canopy. <laughs> Of course, uh, for a short time, there was a little bit of fire there where the shell hit. But anyway, to make a long story short, the fire went out. And uh, the sad part was it knocked all my instruments out. And the plane wouldn't do anything except left turns. <laughs> the controls were frozen in left turn. So everybody said, uh, Sandy, why don't you, uh, 
don't you get the silk? I said, no, that water looks cold. <laughs> Besides that, I wanted to get the plane back because the plane was more important than anything else. Make a long story short, we started doing 360s. My wingman called off airspeed and so forth. <laughs> and we did 360s all the way back about 100 miles down to Corsica to our home base and landed and everything came out okay. <laughs> What you see up here, these are tanks over here, drop tanks. External drop tanks. So, in, in order to let the plane fly a little further, they would sometimes put external gas tanks on the plane. Now, they would use up the fuel in these external tanks first and then eject them. They were made out of laminated plastic so that they would um, be destroyed once they hit ground, and then the Germans or the Italians could use the material to uh, do something with their own planes. So we just thought this was a clever concept here your uh, external gas tanks. See, you done, has got all the facts. <laughs> <laughs> this is a look at the rockets. Tell them what you thought about the rockets. The rockets weren't too good. Uh, <laughs> Really, uh, the rockets weren't like shooting the 50 calibers because the rockets have a, sometimes a funny trajectory. They might go out for a while and then they might curve off. It wasn't like the rockets they have now. They're all controlled with electronics and everything. So we weren't very pleased with rockets, but uh, we knew how to aim that bomb that was in under the belly because that was part of the plane and we shot the, aimed the plane and if the bomb didn't, if we dropped the plane at the same trajectory, we knew it was going to hit pretty close. Wasn't like the rockets. This is just another look at the machine guns that they are actually putting into the plane in this photograph. And those little areas underneath are chutes that they put the shells from the plane into. And they put the shells into the plane. So 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 they put the is under the wing, enclosed in the wing. And these are the ladies that put those machine guns together. They assembled them. And in the lower right hand corner, you see them showing the guns. They were called gun malls. And they would put their names on the front of those guns. I know it's kind of hard to see them. In the middle there in white, you see their names on the guns. So once they were assembled, they would then be put into the plane. And you can see the shells coming through the uh, chutes there at the bottom. I've heard several comments about I couldn't get in that cockpit. That cockpit was pretty roomy. It really was. Uh, give me a good example. Uh, it's about that wide. That's pretty wide. Of course, you got a lot to do in there, but anyway, uh, it's plenty wide. It's got a lot of room. All the instruments were very visible, but everything was on the instrument. No push buttons. Incidentally, Donna has learned more about this than I've forgotten. <laughs> I should have said that the other way around. I've forgotten more than she's learned. Thank you, Donna. damage when they hit the ground. The casings on the planes, did they cause any damage when they hit the ground? Oh, you mean the shells? The oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I really don't know. Just, uh, I wanted to tell you that the pilots of the B-47s, now Alan told you how tough these planes were. They can take a lot of damage. You can't say enough about these engines because they were air-cooled. Most of the planes back then in your cars are water cooled. One hit to your radiator and that car's done for, that plane is done for. But the P-47 had an air-cooled engine. It could take a lot of hits. In fact, you could blow out 
at least three. Oh, look, there's a air coming through. So the B-47 Thunderbolts engine, you could knock out at least three of those cylinders in that plane. There was that photograph up there of the plane that looked like it had been beat up pretty bad. This guy took out a lot of German targets. He was strafing in Germany and still made it back. And that was the nice thing about this plane. It would get those pilots back. In fact, there was a saying. The pilots would say, if you wanted to get a girl, fly a Spitfire. <laughs> if you want to come home to your girl, you fly a Thunderbolt. <laughs> yes, Jeff? I will. It's coming up. All right, so this is just a photograph. You probably recognize the building in the background. It's still here today. Sure, it's the old post office. And they were uh, doing an exhibit of the P-47s in front of the post office during the war. And uh, we have to talk about the uh, people who put these planes together. A lot of them were the Riveters. We talked a little bit about them. Um, you see some ladies up there, Riveters. Uh, here are some Riveters. And here's a good example of a pair working together. In fact, these are twins. Renetta and Janetta. <laughs> and she's got the rivet gun on the front end, and her sister is bucking the rivet on the back end. Then there were also female ferry pilots. Now, remember, a lot of our pilots were over fighting the war, so there was a shortage of pilots to fly the planes from the factories who were making them to where they needed to be used. And so they trained over 1,100 women, and they were part of these organizations, WASP. WAFs, WFTDs, uh, stood for Women Air Force Service Pilots, Women's Auxiliary Ferry Squadrons, Women's Flight Training Detachment, um, and they were called ferry pilots because they took these planes from uh, places like Republic to the, to the coast. The lady on the right is Barbara Erickson, and she was the first female ferry pilot. I, I've got a little uh, information on here about what happened to them. Uh, Barbara was actually the first female pilot, like I said. She was the only woman to be awarded the Army Air Medal in World War II for her service. And that was the unfortunate thing about these ferry pilots, is the military did not recognize them during or after the war. It wasn't until last year that Congress passed a bill that allows these women to, to be buried in Arlington Cemetery. The ladies on the left are Teresa James, she was a popular pilot, and then Betty Gillis in the middle. And look at the ages uh, when they died, 94, 90, 93. We all need to be pilots. <laughs> um, this is actually from, I believe, Hoosier Cardinal, where they were putting the wings together. The reason I have this photo here is the gentleman on the right is a high school. You could be as young as 14 and get a job in one of these plants. You just had to have the permission from the principal of the high school. So you obviously had to be a good student. But yes, they had um, uh, students as young as 14 working in these plants. In fact, Anna, didn't you tell me that one of your partners was a high school, high school student at one time? Oh, I'm sorry. It was Lucy. Lucy's partner was, was in high school. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, eventually in January of 1946, uh, International Harvester purchased the building once Republic left. And then in 1955, this is what we all recognize, is when Whirlpool purchased the building. And of course, they were there for quite some time until uh, a couple of years ago. In June, two years ago, Governor Pence signed a bill. Um, you see some of the folks in this room in that photograph. There's Alan, there's Anna. There's Governor Pence, there's uh, our mayor, uh, signed a bill that uh, makes the Thunderbolt Indiana's official warbird plane. There are only uh, about four other states that have this designation, so the Thunderbolt is our official warbird plane. That's it on Republic. Uh, before we finish, I wanted to talk a little bit about the museum. It's important for the people of Evansville, the students, the kids growing up, that they remember what happened here in the city during the war. It's a very important part of our history because of what we were able to accomplish and help win the war. Because of that, we are collecting, preserving, and making accessible some of the objects that were made here in the city during World War II. 
And we're also getting personal accounts from the people that you've seen here in this room, Alan, Lucy, Emma, and um, Anna. We're getting their stories so that we have those stories in the museum, which is actually open. We opened on Memorial Weekend. Um, our hours on the weekend, Saturdays 10 to 4, Sundays 12 to 4. There's the admission pricing. We are located out at the airport. This is Highway 41. There's Petersburg Road, and there's the hangar that the museum is located in. And there's a Dairy Queen right here. Some of you might recognize that landmark on the corner is that Dairy Queen. This is what it looks like a little bit inside the museum. So when you first go in, uh, is the lobby area. We have some planes uh, up from the ceiling. Uh, we have a couple of other things that are sitting there in the lobby area. And then over here to the left is what we call the home front gallery. And that's where we have a lot of exhibits and materials from the industries that were here in the city. Shipyard, Republic, Chrysler, which made billions of bullets here in the city, produced 96% of the entire supply of 45 caliber bullets for the war. Chrysler. Once you leave the home front gallery here, then you go out into the big uh, hangar area where we have a lot of our military vehicles out there. That's where the engine for the P-47 is located. Uh, we have some information about Republic out there. We have some machines that were used at Republic. Um, and like I said, a lot of vehicles out there. Then uh, this gallery here, when you come in, is what we call the Honor Gallery. And that's where we have the personal effects uh, and materials from some of the soldiers that fought in World War II who were from the city of Evansville. And then the fourth gallery is right here, and we call that the uh, Community Gallery. And that's where we have information about the USOs that were here and the Red Cross the canteen that was here in the city of Evansville. They were famous. Uh, we were famous for the hospitality that we gave to soldiers who came through the city. So it's important uh, that, that we maintain that heritage. A lot of books have been produced and written. Uh, one of the authors was here this morning, Harold Morgan. Uh, examples of some of his books are over here. Harold does the promoting self, so I do it for him. <laughs> this is his latest book. It's, it's a little bit about World War II, but it's mostly about Evansville's history in planes, trains, automobiles, and weather disasters. So that's his newest book. But he's got some great books that he's put out about what Evansville did during World War II. Factories, the soldiers, there were a lot of uh, camps here in the area. Thousands and thousands of soldiers came into the city on the weekends looking for entertainment and girls. <laughs> Believe it or not, we had a huge prostitution problem here in Evansville during World War II. Huge. Any questions? Mark. I'd like to just, can I have the microphone for one second? I wanted to say we have seven World War II veterans in this room. This morning we had four, and there's we already talked about the four women who worked here, but here's one man. This is Don Kulitzmith. He was a pilot in World War II. He's only 95. <laughs> this is David Thomas. David Thomas worked with the P-47s in New Jersey and the P-47s, over 100 were over there at that base most of the time, and he worked there from 43 to 45 with the P-47 squad. <laughs> this is Tamage Wells. He was in the U.S. Army World War II, and I don't know everything he did in World War II, so you'll have to ask him later. <laughs> We have several destroyer men that were on destroyers. We have three back, or three back there uh, and one right here. This gentleman here is uh, uh, Mr. Weber, Herman Weber, and he's only 92 right now, and he was on the USS Taylor. And that had more uh, stars than any other destroyer in World War II, mostly in the Pacific Fleet. This young lady, uh, Irene Blessing, she was the only female that's a World War II veteran here today out of our seven, but she was a nurse in World War II and helped uh, take care of our troops. Uh, US, US Army, 
is this young gentleman here is uh, Bill Muller. He's 100 years old last week or two. He's in a big. His was on a B-24, was shot out of the air, and two people uh, parachuted out. He was one of them, and he was in the German prison camp for, I think, only a year. Alan <laughs> Sanderson, he just talked to you, P-47 pilot, and gave you the talk recently. U.S. Air Force. One other gentleman back here named Mr. Moser, M O S E R. Um, first name is P -P 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 Jerry. Jerry Moser, M O S E R, with his granddaughter. And he was on another destroyer, World War II, both in the East and well, on the East. We'll see in Italy and, and uh, Sicily, is Italy and is Sicily, let's say, in North Africa. But uh, World War II veterans. Who did I miss? Where? Where? You just tell us, Mr. Wolf. Urban Wolf. Urban Wolf. I was, uh, I was in a B-29 group on Guam. We made daily flights to Japan, as you know. That's it. Okay. <laughs> that means that eight, eight, four, two records. We do about 200 funerals a year. And Mr. Wolf and I have with us. Okay. They're, they're, uh, the, they, make this service for a funeral. My father died in 2007 and all these gentlemen were there. They really make it a, a very much of a ritual and uh, 200 funerals this year with these men uh, do all free of charge.